And we got pending, pending, going once, going twice, and raise the appraisal gap, got the appraisal gap. Escrow right here to the front row, and wire fraud. Going once, going twice, we got pre-approval letter, and yes, ooh, escrow to the madam in the back. Going once, going twice, appraisal, appraisal gap. Do terms in real estate just make your head spin? Do you feel like you're at an auction and you're not even quite sure when to raise your paddle? Well, I'm here today to go over the terms that you really need to know as a buyer. Buying a house comes with an entirely new lingo. Real estate is a language all in of itself. So here is a glossary of terms that will help make sense of it all. Active. When a property is listed as active, that simply means that it's available for purchase. Pending. Pending is the term used when a property for sale has accepted a contract and is therefore pending to close. It doesn't mean the deal is done because buyers could always cancel. Proof of funds. Two ways proof of funds can be used. If you are a cash buyer submitting an offer, proof of funds is usually requested to show that you do have the cash accessible. Another proof of funds can sometimes be for a down payment. If you're doing a large down payment, a seller may ask to see a screenshot proving that you have those funds available. Pre-approval letter. This is a letter that you will get from the lender you're using for your loan. After they take you through their qualification process, they'll pull your credit, verify your job history, and some other things, and then they'll give you a letter stating what type of loan you're approved for and how much. This letter will accompany any offer that you and your agent write so that the seller knows you're serious and you've done your homework. Seller's disclosure. A seller's disclosure is something that the owner of the house fills out. In Florida, it's typically a four page document full of yes, no, or don't know questions. It is the seller's fiduciary responsibility to make sure they tell any buyer what they know about the house. If they know there's a leak, if they know there's something defective, legally they have to disclose it to you. When buying a home, you will review the seller's disclosure. It's a great way to just have a preliminary look at what issues might be coming up in the house and what you might wanna have your inspector take a second look at. Contracts, as is versus residential. This is a two-part answer. In Florida, two of the most common contracts that we see are the as-is contract and the residential contract. The as-is contract is one of the most popular ones that's used in the Alachua County area. And while you're buying the house as-is, it doesn't mean that you can't make requests. What the as-is contract refers to is that during the inspection period, you as the buyer can pay whoever you want to test the house however you want, as long as it doesn't do any permanent damage. And then you are absolutely allowed to ask for credits, repairs, and price reductions, but the seller is not contractually obligated to do anything. But if you can't come to an agreement, you can cancel and get your deposit back. The residential contract pre-negotiates any repairs. You will put amounts of money or percentages of price for general repairs, WDO issues, or any open permits. These amounts are pre-agreed upon at the contract, and if during the inspection something comes up that's higher than the agreed upon amount, the seller is only obligated to what's in the contract. Offer. When you find the house, you and your agent are gonna to put together your offer. This is simply putting onto paper the terms with which you are willing to purchase the house. The seller will review it, and once they sign it, it's officially a contract. But your offer will discuss things like price, your escrow deposit, closing date, inspection terms, and there's a litany of other options that you can use when putting together your offer. Work really closely with your agent because they'll make sure everything's crystal clear and right in line with your goals. Counter offer. Once you submit your initial offer to the sellers, they can counter. What that means is they've reviewed your terms and they're coming back to you with a different proposal. Maybe they're gonna counter on a higher price, or maybe they're gonna counter on doing a shorter inspection period, or maybe a longer closing with a lease back because they need to buy a house before they move. The counter offer is just part of the negotiations. It goes back and forth and nothing's official till both parties sign and it's been delivered to that other party. Acceptance date. The acceptance date you'll find towards the bottom of page one, and it lets the seller and the listing agent know how long your offer is good for. 
A standard amount of time in our market currently is 24 hours. Depending upon your situation, you can do shorter amounts of time or longer. A lot of sellers are requesting several days to collect and review all offers. So if the house is super important to you, you may be willing to extend your acceptance date. But if you're not wanting to wait around and lose out on other houses, you can stick to your acceptance date and after that date passes, if it's not signed and delivered, the offer is void. Closing costs. Closing costs are the fees that are due in addition to your down payment at closing. Closing costs can include things like property taxes, lender fees, appraisal, and more. If you're seeking financing for a loan, the majority of your closing costs typically comes from your lender. But your lender should be able to give you a pretty upfront cost sheet at the beginning of your transaction. Other fees can include credits to sellers or possibly prepaying your HOA or your insurance premium. Your lender is one of your best sources to figure out what your closing costs are gonna be, so make sure you're having an open line of communication right in the beginning. Escrow. Escrow is an amount of money that you as the buyer are going to put down right at the beginning of the transaction. In our area, one to 2% of the purchase price is standard, but the higher your escrow, the more competitive your offer can be. This money is going towards the purchase price of the house, so it's not in addition to. But the reason you're putting it down up front is because you wanna show the seller you're serious and have some skin in the game. The escrow can be refundable, it just depends on the terms of your contract. And what I always tell my buyers is that my job is to either get you to the end of this with keys in your hand or help you to navigate being able to close and get your escrow back. Down payment. Your down payment is the money that's due right up front on closing day. Depending upon the type of loan program you're looking into, it can be anywhere from 0% like it is for veterans all the way up to 20, 30, 50, 60, whatever percentage you want. The down payment is the amount of money that you are paying and then the remainder is part of your loan. Down payment programs that are most common are typically 3.5%, 5%, 10%, or 20%. Inspection period. Your inspection period usually starts on day one, unless otherwise written in the contract, and can go anywhere from three to 10 to 15 to 20 days. The contract standard in our area is 15 days, but with the competitive market we're dealing in, the shorter, the better. During your inspection period, you can, at your own expense, bring in anybody you want to look over the house. Exterminator, plumber, electrician, home inspector, structural engineer, it's all at your cost, and as long as you don't do any permanent damage to the house, you can check it out any way you want to. This gives you a chance to see what you're really buying. And if any issues come up, it's also an opportunity to go back to the seller and see what you can negotiate. Doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a credit or repairs, but it gives you the opportunity to decide if you wanna move forward or if it's time to walk away. WDO. WDO, or Wood Destroying Organism, is part of your inspection period. This is where you'll get in touch with a local exterminator or pest control company to take a look through the inside and outside of your home. They will look for termites, any other evidence of pests, wood rot, any kind of fungus issues, and they give you a really nice comprehensive report so you can determine if it's a major issue you need to go back to the seller for or if it's just something you can repair once you move in. Home warranty. A home warranty is kind of like a short-term insurance policy for you as an owner. Depending upon the market conditions, sellers do sometimes pay for a home warranty, or as a buyer, you can get one for yourself. The cost varies whether you're purchasing a condo, townhome, or single family detached, but it basically covers major appliances and systems for one year. The cost of a home warranty can vary. That depends on whether you're living in a condo, townhome, or single family house. What a home warranty does is basically cover your major systems and appliances for one year. The good news is that these policies can be renewed year after year. With a home warranty, if your dishwasher breaks or your AC goes out, you call the home warranty company and they use one of their vendors to come out and either repair or replace the item. Particularly if you're a first time home buyer, these can be a great place to start just to make sure that you're covered for that first year. 
appraisal. Appraisals are all about value. When you're getting a loan from a bank, after you get through your inspection period, the lender's gonna order an appraisal, which means that the bank is going to have an appraiser come out to assess the value of the property. That value is assessed based on similar houses in the area that have recently sold, as well as the condition of the house you're looking at. The appraiser will go back and do all their research and come back with a report giving a value of what they think the house is worth. Escalation. Escalations are like eBay for real estate. When you're in a multiple offer situation, sometimes it's hard to know at what price you should come in and you may not want to leave all your money right on the table. So what I often do with my buyers is an escalation clause. This basically says that you will beat out any other competing offers by a certain amount up to a certain price. Here's an example. If the house you're looking at is priced at 300,000, but you're willing to pay up to 325,000, you come in and give your offer and say, in the event of other competing offers, we the buyers will go up in increments of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, all the way up to 325. So if you're at 300 and somebody comes in at 310, it'll automatically kick you up all the way to your cap, which is truly your highest and best. Appraisal gap. In a crazy market like this, where prices are skyrocketing, the values can't always keep up. But if you love a house enough, sometimes you're willing to overpay a little bit. That's where the appraisal gap comes in. Because if you're seeking financing for a loan, the bank is gonna loan you your money based on what the appraiser says. But if you've got some extra money on hand, when you put your offer together, you can do an appraisal gap. What the appraisal gap says is basically, hey, Mr. Buyer and Seller, if the house does not appraise, here's how much money we're willing to throw at the problem. In my career, I've seen appraisal gaps as low as 1,000 and as high as 100,000. But you better make sure it's cash you have on hand in addition to your down payment and in addition to your closing costs. Appraisal contingency. An appraisal contingency is a safety net for you as a buyer. What it tells the seller is that if the house does not appraise, which means if the value of the appraisal is lower than the contract price, you can either renegotiate with the seller or you can pull out of the contract and get your deposit back. When the appraisal comes in low, one of four things is gonna happen. Either you're gonna bring the extra money to closing, the seller's gonna reduce their price, you're gonna meet somewhere in the middle, or you're gonna walk away. What the appraisal contingency does is it protects your escrow deposit. Any of those four things can happen without the contingency, but without the contingency, you may be forfeiting your escrow. Closing date. The closing date is the end of the tunnel. When you put together an offer, you and your agent will discuss with the listing agent, sellers, and your lender to determine what's an acceptable date to close on the house. Closing on the house just means ownership is now transferred to you. If you're a cash buyer, closing can be as soon as 10 days. If you're doing financing, you're probably looking closer to 30 to 45 days. And if you've got a seller who either needs an extended closing or wants a lease back, that's a conversation you have with your agent. Post occupancy. In real estate, when the house closes, the keys change hands, the seller leaves, the buyer comes in. As of late, we've seen a really common trend of doing a post-occupancy, and here's what that means. A post-occupancy is when the house closes, but you, the buyer, don't move in because the seller's going to stay. This is a pre-agreed upon amount of time and price. It's a really useful tool as a buyer in a competitive market because if you can work around the seller's schedule, they're probably more likely to work with you. With the post-occupancy, what typically happens is at closing, the closing attorney or title company will hold on to an agreed upon security deposit and hold on to the rental amount of money. Once the post-occupancy is over, the buyer gets to do their walkthrough, move in, and collect on the funds. Pre-occupancy. Pre-occupancy, it's just the opposite of post-occupancy. What it means is you, the buyer, gets to move into the house before it closes. This is typically done if the buyer has a gap in housing or perhaps closing gets delayed. You and the seller will agree upon the terms. You'll agree upon a security deposit as well as a per diem rate for which you're going to rent the house. 
lead paint disclosure. A lead paint disclosure is for any house that was built before 1978. Back in those days, paint had lead in it and lead can be extremely harmful if it's ingested. So if you're purchasing a house that was built before 1978, the seller should be providing a lead paint disclosure. This discloses whether or not the seller has any knowledge of lead in the paint. Depending upon how many times ownership has flipped hands, the seller may not actually know if there's any lead, but it's just a good notification for you as a buyer to know that if you start scraping off paint, make sure you do it in a safe way. Wire fraud. In the digital age, wire fraud is becoming more and more popular, in real estate especially. With wire fraud, it's all about knowing where you're sending your money. At closing, when you're bringing your down payment and your closing costs, you can either do a cashier's check or you can wire your funds to closing. Wiring has become an ever increasingly easier option and it's what a lot of buyers like to go for. But I caution you to pay very close attention because here's what happens. With wire fraud, you have a hacker and they hack into somebody's email, whether it's buyer's agent, seller's agent, the lender, the closing attorney, the buyer, the seller, then they just watch. And they watch to see emails going back and forth to figure out there's the lender, that's the buyer, that's the seller. And then as it nears closing day, they watch for the email to come through with the wiring instructions for the buyer. And you know what they do? They draft an email that has the same heading and same logo, and sometimes even what appears to be the exact same email address, and they flip the wiring instructions. So on closing day, when you wire in your down payment and then show up to closing, and you've just wired it to an offshore account, it is a sickening feeling because that money is gone and you're probably not buying a house. So the best thing to do to make sure when you're wiring your money is to call and confirm with the company what the wiring instructions are. And don't call off the number in the email they just sent you, look them up online or get the number from your realtor to make sure it's legit. Whew, that was a lot. But I wanna make sure when you go to buy your home, you are educated and you know what the terms are. Having a knowledge of this lingo could edge you out against other buyers and just make sure that you're making an educated decision with what could be your largest financial purchase ever. And speaking of that large financial purchase, when you're going through your inspection periods, don't miss my video on the red flags you should be looking for during inspections. I'm Lindsay Johnson, your resource for all things real estate. See you next time.